Hey everybody, this is part two of my top 10 favorite film scores, six through 10. The first one is There Will Be Blood, and this is composed by Johnny Greenwood, and this is easily the most current film on the list. Johnny Greenwood is, of course, the uh, bass guitarist for Radiohead, and you know, Radiohead to me is one of the greatest bands ever, one of my personal favorites. And after hearing what he did for this film, I was just amazed by how versatile of a, a musician he is. I mean, he really has chops in many areas, and I love seeing that side of like, you know, popular band members that, you know, may, everybody may know in a more accessible way or like rock stars. I love seeing that other side of them, kind of like, for instance, Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails doing all the scores for the, the David Fincher films. But I think that Johnny is a inspired choice for There Will Be Blood, mainly because, you know, it just has such personality. And of course, the music of Radiohead has a lot of personality as well. Um, the music in this film, though, is very it's seething, very esoteric, and it incorporates a lot of just strings, piano, and percussion mostly. And that really grounds the listener and the viewer listener uh, in the first half of the 20th century, which is when it takes place. Yet it has a contemporary twist to it. You can tell that Greenwood was probably very inspired by a lot of 20th century composers like um, Stravinsky it reminds me a bit of the Rite of Spring and um, Christoph Penderecki. And there's also a touch of that electronic edge that we know and love from Radiohead in there as well. So the film itself is about greed and capitalism and the ferocity. And it, all of this is embodied in the main character of Daniel Plainview. And you see so much of this represented in the music because the music has such intensity that's brought out in this very dissonant nature of, of the strings that sound, they're very kind of discordant, clashing, sliding up and down, kind of very Hitchcockian, um, psycho Bernard Herrmann style. But my favorite parts of the score are the slower portions of it. And I like that because to me that really represents more of the humanity beneath all of that ferocity in Daniel Plainview. And there's a particular piece that plays at the very end of the score, closes the soundtrack. It's this wonderful kind of string quartet, beautiful, very moving, very sad, and it really reflects that alienating um, relationship between uh, Daniel Plainview and his son and how they slowly distance each other. And I think that the, the son is maybe the only tie Daniel Plainview ever had um, in terms of having a family, at least in the film, and it's just, it's heartbreaking to watch. The next score I have on this list is Citizen Kane, and this is composed by Bernard Herrmann. I am a huge Bernard Herrmann fan. Nina Rota, Bernard Herrmann. I think they are the greatest film composers to have ever lived, personally. I could have easily put five or six Bernard Herrmann scores on this list because he did just so many incredible ones, but I think this one stands out for me, and which is kind of ironic because it's not a very popular choice. A lot of people don't even know that Herman did the score for Citizen Kane. That film really put Bernard Herman on the map as far as becoming more notable as a film composer. But I think the main reason nobody really pays attention to the soundtrack itself is because the film is, is so, I don't want to say obnoxious, but it's, it's very bombastic. It's got, it's, it's very aggressive in terms of its style. So I think that Herman definitely had a major task of trying to tailor music to a film that has such Shakespearean dimension. But I think what he does so well is he offsets a lot of that grandiose, very gothic imagery that you see in the film with a more intimate and nostalgic soundtrack that is, it's not subtle, but it's got more subtlety than, than you would expect. And I think that he does that because the film itself is has a lot of very personal themes that a lot of people I think fail to recognize. They're so um, caught up in the style, Orson Welles' vision as an auteurist, but I think the film is very personal. It's a film that is about memory and regret and failed relationships and for me I find it heartbreaking and the score to me matches that so well. The key to why Herman was so great was because he did create music that was extremely dramatic and it felt very Hollywood, yet it had this depth to it that almost felt like it was just creeping into your mind. It had a very almost uncomfortably poetic and sad feel to it. And especially at that time, I think it was really, really hard for composers to be melancholy without being too sentimental or really operatic without being too obvious and Herman just was that fine line. He got it just right. Lawrence of Arabia is the next film on my list and this music is composed by Maurice Jarre and I, I love this movie so much. It is probably, I think, one of my favorite movies of all time. It is just, it staggers the imagination. I don't understand, I mean, I guess of course it was different times, it was the 60s, but how a film could have such scope and ambition but be 
at equally as intelligent. I don't see films, particularly out of Hollywood, that are this intelligent. Injar worked with David Lean, the director of Lawrence of Arabia, many times. He was a frequent collaborator, and I think he's really what brings the films to life. I mean, he gives it kind of the air in order to exist in a way. He created so many iconic themes in a lot of the David Lean films, and in the case of Lawrence of Arabia, it's yet again another iconic theme. And of course it is one thing to just say, well, that's a really memorable score and it sounds beautiful, but I think there's more depth to it than people actually think there is. And the more that I listen to the soundtrack, I realize that so much of what you hear in the music really represents the way that Lawrence, the main character, how he sees Arabia and how how he wants it to be. The music and the metaphor of the desert are very similar in that there's this facade of romanticism, cleanliness, beauty. Um, Lawrence says that one of his favorite things about the desert is that it's clean. But beneath it there's so much war brewing and insanity. And Lawrence spends the entire time being torn between two very different cultures, of course his culture and of course being with the Arabs. And the score to me represents that mix of kind of very traditional score that you hear in a lot of Hollywood movies with that Arabian feel and it's a, it has a very alluring quality to it and that represents so much of the conflict within Lawrence. The film itself, you think it's going to be this big grand kind of Ben-Hur like movie and it's not. Uh, this is a very dark film about a very, very complex man and I like to describe the score as, it's like a rose, it's very lush, very idyllic looking, but underneath it is this sharpness, this thorn that's very unexpected, and that is what's so wonderful about it. On the Waterfront by Leonard Bernstein is my next choice. Um, Leonard Bernstein to me is one of the great composers of the 20th century. I mean, everything he did was amazing, and if you, if any of you out there are musicians who have tried to play um, the music by Leonard Bernstein, it is Hard. This score represents vintage Bernstein. It's very brassy, very cacophonous jazz music that is very reminiscent of a, something that was on my list in my part one video, uh, Man with a Golden Arm, but this one to me has a lot more complexity. Bernstein combines a lot of like traditional orchestral styles in his music with a tougher, kind of more contemporary edge, and I think this works really well for the film because the film is a very stripped down, very gritty view of corruption in New York at the time. It is very blue collar, lots of very husky mobsters, lots of grim dark alleys and that sort of thing. It's very in your face for sure, very percussive, but I personally, again, I, I gotta say, I, I prefer in the soundtrack, as, as much as I love everything about it, my favorite parts are the slower parts, the ones that kind of reveal more humanity. It really gives the string section a chance to really cut loose and it has a very sweeping, very rich American feel to it and I like to say it's like um, listening to what Aaron Copeland's evil twin would write because it has that American feel that you'd hear from Aaron Copeland but it's a lot darker. But what amazes me about Leonard Bernstein is that he, this is the only film score he ever wrote because he was kind of busy doing other things like, you know, West Side Story, maybe you've heard of it. So some people think that's kind of a bummer, but I would honestly have to say that this score to me is equal to 10 scores from the average composer, so if this is all that we get from Bernstein in terms of film scores, I'll take it, because he's done a lot of other great work. And the final film I'm going to pick here, the final musical score, is Vertigo, and this is composed by Bernard Herrmann as well. This is the second score that I have on this list by him. Of all the work that Herrmann did, this is his most introspective, his most painfully poignant, and it's also accompanied by Hitchcock's greatest film, at least I think it's Hitchcock's greatest film. Hitchcock was a master of suspense, of manipulation, of entertainment, and I think that this was one of the first times he really became more introspective himself. And he's, the film itself to me is about tearing down American ideals, a lot of the ideals that he himself has been hypnotized by, to expose a very uncomfortable truth that is underneath it, a very cynical society. I actually think this film is very similar to Mulholland Drive, and I'm sure Mulholland Drive was heavily influenced by this film, because the first half of the film is meant to be very manipulative. It's meant to be uh, very romantic, to the point where it's almost laughable. It's, it's over the top. But the fact that it's so passionate and so exaggerated to me is a key point, because when all of that is stripped away in the second half of the film, and you realize everything that you thought you knew was faulty and all an illusion, 
it it all unravels and it distorts into something that is a lot deeper. And the love theme represents that, you know, it's very erotic, very passionate, but it's also very haunting and very eerie the more that you listen to it. You get very compelled by it and then you start to realize that so much in it kind of reflects our hidden inner desires and it's it's uncomfortable. I just feel just really impacted by the film itself, but when I listen to the soundtrack, all of that comes to the surface. I start to realize that, you know, like as a society, it, it's how far will we go to achieve our most inner desires? We will get to the point where it becomes masochistic and we will cover up the truth. My favorite part of the score is uh, a section right at that halfway point where the truth is finally exposed, where Judy writes the letter to Scotty explaining herself before she tears it up. And I find that part, it's very simple. It's just strings and, and, and chords, very haunting. And of all of the soundtracks that I've heard, for some reason, that one gets me so much. It's because it's so raw. It's it's the truth that has been covered up up to that point. But the score is just, it's just, it's erotic and neurotic and chanting yet kind of um, eerie. And I have no words. I just, it moves me more than almost any score. And it's easily one of my favorites, obviously. And that's my top 10. Let me know what some of your favorite scores are. That I always find to be very interesting to hear what people have to say. Um, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, the link is below. And you can also like my Facebook page in the link below that. Catch you next time.